80% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level forward depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I've never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I've seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive, you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro black philosophers, the BGF, the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony, quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church, hide knives up in a Bible Political and tribal, the Crips and Damus The Long Beast, the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE, the Bakersfield the day go pie rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click you choose you better... say what's cracking youtube it's your boy 16 to life and i'm back like i'm on a pro violation yard down yeah you know we about to get into this story today man and for those of y'all that's new to my page in 1994 i got arrested i was sentenced to 16 years plus a life sentence I end up doing 24 years straight in some of these California prisons out here. And during that time, I accumulated some stories for y'all. And I'm about to hop into one right now. You know, um, in 2018, I eventually was found suitable for parole, what they call it out here. You know, I was, cause I was, I had life. So I had to go to the parole board. Once I was found suitable for parole, maybe a couple of weeks before I was due to release, you know, I had my ID right here. I took it and I hid it in some of my letters and I went and told them that I lost my ID so they had to give me another one, you know. And so the reason why I brought this home is just to look at it from time to time, you know, and keep myself mindful of where I've been and to never go back to that, you know what I'm saying? So with that being said, you know what I'm saying, let's hop into this story. Now, remember I told y'all back in about like 1989, I had slapped these, uh, I slapped this owner of a store across his head with a baseball bat. So they sent me to Juvenile Hall. While I was in Juvenile Hall, I ended up meeting this dude for all intents and purposes of this story. I'ma call him Crafty B. Now Crafty B was facing a murder charge. I think he was about 17. And this was 89 and he never did get out. You know, he ended up getting found guilty. So now in uh, 1996, when I went to the pen, you know, I see a cat up in the child hall. You know, and I'm, I'm looking at him like, hey, man, I know you from somewhere, you know. And so we go to talk and I said, man, oh, yeah, was you in Riverside? Was you in the juvenile hall? And so he said, yeah. And so it turned out to be Crafty B, you know what I'm saying? So we chop it up. We talked a day or two. So about on the third day, maybe somewhere around there, he happened to come to the chow hall. I guess he sees some dude. He said, hey, what's up, man? So I'm a bitch, huh? So I'm a bitch, huh? Boop, pop, boop, pop. He get off on him right there. You know what I'm saying? They had a, you know, they had an impromptu meeting of the fist in the snot box. You know what I'm saying? He bust old boy up right there. So, you know, they put the yard down. They put the yard down and shit, shot the block gun or whatever. And uh, get them two up out of there. And I don't see him no more. You know, so now come. 2008, 2009, somewhere up in there, I'm at another prison, CMC East. And you know what I'm saying? He ended up showing up. You know what I'm saying? So now he's also from the county that I'm from. So we happen to ride in the same car. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, we get to chopping it back and up. We talk, you know, we talking and shit. Now, like I say, during this time, a whole lot of time has gone by. And I don't know if Crafty had always been Crafty, but now I'm getting to see some of his moves, man. Crafty B is a real slick. And like I was telling y'all, CMC is a different pen at in 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 a lot of ways. And uh, one way is they got ducats there. Now, what ducats are? Okay, when we go to commissary or canteen, we go outside the gate. We go to the main big store. We can shop. You know, what I'm thinking. I'm, I think we could spend like two hundred and twenty dollars. And we also was allowed. 50 ducats each each uh, each time we went to the store if we wanted. Now, what a ducat is basically is just a dollar. You know what I'm saying? You they take money off your books. You buy 50 ducats. They give you you buy you purchase 50 dollars worth of ducats. They give you 50 ducats. And 50 ducats, like I say, each one is just it's like a it's just like a piece of paper. And the, what the ducats are intended for is on the yard they have a mini canteen. And it's like a snack bar. And the snack bar sell potato chips, ice cream, you know, uh, candy, sodas, and things of that nature. But of course, by everybody having them ducats, the ducat also became a form of currency. You know, normally at other pens, people might, might trade soaps, I mean, uh, stamps, soaps, you know, uh, 
food item that we can get from the from the store. But no, here at CMC, everybody wanted these ducats. You know what I'm saying? And which made it cool because it was a it was a cool way to hustle and make money. Now, people would also go to the on visits and get a hundred dollar bill or or some cash. Now, when they would bring the hundred dollar bill back in cash money, you could turn that hundred dollar bill in for a person who was hustling or whatever and had a gang of ducats. And the go and the going rate was about 170, 180 ducats, all depending on you know what the going rate was on that yard. So, like I say, instead of having your family send you money, some people would just get the money on the visit, and they could even turn it into more money. You know what I'm saying? So. People would do that. And like I say, by by them ducats being so popular, it made the yard so much fun and, and cool because it was it was an economy going on. You know, you even had a few dirty police men who would be taking ducats from people. They'd take ducats from people and they'd be selling them to the convicts for they'd give the convicts 180, maybe 200 ducats, 250 because it was a free hundred dollars for them. Because like I said, a person is only allowed to have 50 bucks. You know what I'm saying? So it was a whole lot going on. So now I'm starting to see that old Crafty B got a few moves on him. You know, now also how the prison is different. The prison, like I told y'all, is like a big old wagon wheel, man. It's the best way to describe it. When you go out the gate, it's like they call it the plaza. And they have, you know, they have A yard, B yard, C yard, and D yard. And it's like a big old circle. And so what's so different about this pen also, if you're in another prison and, and your homie, homie is on another yard, you'll never see him because he might be, the yard, the, the yard might be two, three miles apart. And you got to go through gates and shit to get all to him. But here, all you had to do was walk out the gate. You know, you flash your ID to the little screen like I'm doing here. Now, it's a dude that sits in the middle of that wagon wheel. He, it's, it's a control booth and he's like 20 or 30 feet away from the gate. So basically, he's looking through the screen and he'll see, you know, now you hold your ID up, the ID is supposed to have like a b or c right here where this yellow thing is and so he'd see what yard you was on and he'd let you out and then that was the same way that you get back in you come to a turnstile so you could also go to other yards you know you could tell somebody hey man you on a yard hey let me let me get your id let me get your id so he slides you the id and you just walk through the turnstile you know flash your id and you'd be on that yard you know, because each yard, you know, each yard might have had, you know, one day this yard might have all the drugs, all the weed, all the tobacco, or whatever. So one day, Crafty B makes his way to C yard. Now, at that particular time, C yard was dry when it came to tobacco. And like I told y'all, okay, I, maybe I didn't tell y'all, um, like around 2002, the prisons in California stopped allowing the prisoners to smoke. So, of course, Tobacco became a much sought after commodity, you know, like I was telling y'all in one of my other other my videos that uh, me and Scanners D, we used to go half on a can of tobacco for uh, five hundred dollars. So they used to sell pouches in the store. Now, a pouch that used to be about maybe a uh, dollar fifty, two dollars now was fifty dollars, you know, because it was it was highly it was highly uh, wanted and it was hard to get. So. What old Crafty B do, he go over there, he knew somebody that was looking for some tobacco. So Crafty B said, yeah, man, there's somebody on our yard that's selling three pouches for 100 So give me $100 and I'll bring you back the pouch. So when old boy give Crafty B the $100, Crafty B come back to the yard. He knew somebody that worked in the program office. The program office is where the lieutenants, the captains, you know, they, they up in there. They also have clerks, you know, clerks who do the bed moves, control the shit like that. Also, if you get a disciplinary write-up, what's called a 115, you know, the clerks, the clerks type up the 115 and all that type of shit, you know. So, Crafty B knew somebody that worked up in there, so he went and told him, hey, man, look, I'm going to give you X amount of ducats, probably 15, 20 ducats, 30 ducats, you know, you know, uh, type type up a 115 with my name on it saying I got caught with a $100 bill. So the old boy types it, you know, he types it up legitly, you know, me, officer, such and such, you know, on, on this date, I caught whoop-de-whoop -whoop in the plaza. I searched him. He had $100 U.S. currency on him. Now, the, uh, the write-up, it's fake, but the paper is real. You know what I'm saying? So what Crafty B do, he end up taking the, the fake write-up back to the dude on C-Yard and said, hey, man, listen, man, when I was leaving with, with the $100 bill, I got pulled over in the uh, in the rotunda, in the plaza, what they call it. They searched me and they found the $100 bill, man. So uh, they took it. I don't have it, man. So I, I'll try to get it back to you when I can. Or whatever game he wrote, he ran on him. Now, oh boy, who who lost the money? He know this is he know this is true because he's seeing this, he's seeing this 115. He don't know it's fake. And also he know that the guards be searching people in the in the plaza because they know people be going, you know, from yard to yard, got cigarettes, tobacco on them, all type of shit. They're not supposed to be doing. So now 
we had put up, we had, when I say we, I'm talking about me, my homie, uh, uh, Maurice Tansy, man, t Row, rest in peace now from Colton City. Me and him were sellies at the time, you know. t Row was another, he always was making moves, man. He always had a thousand get-rich-quick schemes now. So, uh, uh, CMC East is a uh, medium security prison, a level three. But now, CMC West is level two. Now, we had, and I, I, I really want to say it, but I don't want to expose it, but we had a way of getting tobacco from CMC West to CMC East. And what's at CMC West, the tobacco was much cheaper because CMC West was a minimum security yard. So a lot of those dudes, you know, they had jobs where they would leave the grounds, the actual prison grounds, and go out to the park and be cleaning up and this and that. So they'd have people bring them, you know, tobacco from the street. And so they bring it back to the yard, and it was cheaper on West Yard, but on East Yard, it still was, you know, it, the prices was marked up. So we had a way of we'd send ducats to the West Yard and get the ducats back. Now, unfortunately for us, when the, I mean, excuse me, we'd get the tobacco back. But now, unfortunately for us, the tobacco came through on a job that... uh that Crafty B was working. So Crafty B would get the tobacco and he'd bring the tobacco to me and my Selly T roll. Every time we got the tobacco, the tobacco was light, you know. Crafty B smoked cigarettes and then like I said, you can go sell, you can go sell the tobacco, get the duckets, you can do a whole bunch of shit, you know. To tobacco was the most sought after product up there, you know. Every time he'd bring, he'd bring the shit, it would be light, you know. But what could we say? Because we still was making a killing. But we already knew that Crafty B, of course, he was, he was, you know, he was definitely was taking some and this and that. So at some point in time, though, I don't know what it was about, but I remember, you know, uh, T-Roll and Crafty B, they fell out. Like I said, we all from the same, we all from the same collective, man. We all from the same county, so we all ran together. So it was some, you know, uh, some petty bullshit. Both, both, uh... T-Roll and Crafty B, they both smoked cigarettes and they both gambled a whole lot. You know what I'm saying? So they, they was good partners, but from time to time, they'd fall out for a couple of days, wouldn't be talking to each other over some small bull or whatever, you know? So now, like I say, we had put together this lick where we, we was getting this tobacco. And also my boy Crafty B, man, he was, this dude was crazy. He was running around there at one point in time, he was running around there selling fake heroin. He had a little coffee and a few other little items, He a, a little a couple of ingredients that he hooked up together and be selling motherfuckers, telling them it was heroin and shit. Now, you know, in the pen, playing with a motherfucker's high, that's a quick way to leave the prison way before the judge plan, planned on you leaving. You know what I'm saying? Because a motherfucker will, will blast you out your boots if you playing with their money. But Crafty B, he took these motherfucking chances and plus he knew the right motherfuckers to play these games with or at least he felt he knew you know what i'm saying because it's always a chance of a motherfucker man you know going for broke when you didn't play him out of some of his money but like i say old crafty b he had the heart of a gunslinger man this motherfucker he didn't give a fuck old crafty b he stayed taking risks and doing things that could potentially get his motherfucking head knocked off you know and i'm sure there's a every there's a crafty b in every penitentiary in, in uh, across America, you know, some dude who always gonna try to toe the line and be as slick as possible, you know, out there playing poker with extra cars up his sleeves and all that old type of shit. So eventually, the lick we put together with getting the, the tobacco from West Yard brought over to East Yard some type of way, the COs got up on that and they ran into sales of a few major players, took a lot of cash to the hole. Luckily for Crafty B, though, he, he escaped. So he felt, you know, he felt that job was kind of hot and it was time for him to get up out of there. So he ended up getting another job in the chapel as a porter slash clerk. So uh, CMC, they had like two chapels. One chapel was, was designated for the Jewish dudes and the Catholic dudes. And the other chapel, which which uh, Crafty B worked in, it was for, you know, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Indians, you know. Now the Indians, due to their cultural and spiritual beliefs, they was allowed, they had an actual sweat lodge on the prison, and they was allowed to, you know, go in the sweat lodge, do do their spiritual cleansing, you know, smoke their tobacco, uh, you know, their peace pipes or whatever it was up in there, you know what I'm saying? And it had to be put up in a locker in the chapel or whatever. So, so okay, so now a couple months and go go then went past. Me and my celly T, T roll of rest in peace from Colton City from the zoo. You know, we in the cell playing chess now. Around 11, 30, 12 o'clock, we had to lock up for count. Now, at this time, count had cleared, so now we just waiting for the yard to open. And, you know, now the doors and shit is open though, and to the cell. So we in there, we playing chess. All of a sudden, now just so happened, our cell was on the on the yard side. So, you know, you could, you could come from the yard and holler up to somebody's cell, and they had windows that could open. You could throw shit out the window and all this type of shit. So, anyway, Crafty B come. He like, hey, roll up! 
Roll up. So we sitting there playing chess and, and, and T-Roll just ignoring him. I said, hey, man, don't you hear the homie out here calling you? He like, oh, man, fuck him, man. <coughs> Excuse me, but he's steady out there. Roll up, roll up. So <coughs> T-Roll say, man, what? So he get up and he go to the door. He say, man, who the best? Crafty B say, who the best? Uh, uh, Roller say, man, I don't got time for this shit. He say, who the best? So now I get up, I walk up over there. I look down, you know, we like on the second floor. Uh, Crafty B is standing there. He got his little state jacket on, you know. He say, Roller, who the best? He opened his jacket up. This dude got like three or four big giant ass bags of tobacco and shit. Like 30, you know, like probably like a 64 ounce bag and shit. He say, man, hurry up and come get this shit. So t Row, he, pew, that motherfucker fly up out of that motherfucker. He hurry up, run downstairs. He come back with the tobacco and shit. He like, man, yeah. He said, uh, Crafty said, make you a cone, give you a cone for 50. I see, I think the cones normally go for 75. And what a cone was, basically, it was an empty toilet paper roll of uh, tobacco. So what we do, we'd, we'd stand that motherfucker up. We would drop it in there, you know, not stuff it, just drop, continuously drop the tobacco in there until it got to the top. And then that was going for $75 out there, you know. So he said, yeah, make you one up, make him one up. Sack up the rest, and I guess Crafty had somebody who was going to sell the tobacco for him. He said, you know, and he said, man, look, he said, don't let nobody know this tobacco came from him or whatever, whatever. So, okay, so I go to make him my, I go to make him my cone, you know, and I fuck all that just dropping and fluffing that shit up in there. I'm stuffing the hell out of my cone. I'm stuffing. So, uh, uh, T-Roll looking at me like, chill, man, you going to do that? I said, man, fuck this motherfucker. I said, man, this motherfucker been whooping us for about three, four months, man, stealing our tobacco. He was like, oh, yeah, you right, huh? You right, huh? So, like I said, I made me a fat ass cone, you know, I stuffed that motherfucker as much as I could, stuff and stuff and stuff, you know, all this motherfucking tobacco he got, so, uh, so, you know, we, we do that shit and get him back to the tobacco, you know, he, he have somebody else go sell the tobacco, he took, now, now, when I see him too later that day, he said, hey, chill, man, make sure you don't tell nobody, you know, the tobacco came from me, I, I'm gonna have my boy slanging it for me, I said, man, don't even trip, it's all good and shit, you know, so now, when I ran out of tobacco, maybe, because I, I would have somebody roll the cigarettes for me and then sell the cigarettes. The cigarettes was like $3 a holler. And then, like I said, y'all, I would get them ducats. And I would stack the ducats up and shit. Now, you know, I might I might end up with five, 600 ducats up in there. So sometimes I would go buy a $100 bill for 180 bucks or whatever it was because it was easier to conceal and hide, you know. And then... In the, in the event I needed some ducats, I could always go resell it. Because like I said, if you get caught with more than 50 ducats, the police going to take it. They had some crooked-ass police. They might take, you know, two, 300 ducats from somebody <clears throat> and then go sell it to somebody else for a $100 bill. You know, they had a lot of scandalous shit going on up there. So, you know, that's why I would go I would go buy a $100 bill. Or sometimes what I would also do, like I told y'all, some people had restitution. And if they send money, the, um, the state is going to take 55% of that. So... They would come buy ducats for me. They, you know, maybe want 50 ducats or 100 ducats or whatever it was. I would have them, have they folks, Western Union the money. Once they give me the number and, you know, I'd, ha I'd have my people go get the money from Western Union, check and make sure it was there. Once it was there, then I would get them 50 ducats. So like I say, man, it was it was a lot of good hustling going on up, up at that motherfucker or whatever. So I ran out of tobacco a couple times and I would go back to uh, Old Crafty. He didn't want to sell me no more after a while. He said it was all gone. So I'm like, hey, man, well, look, go get some more, man. I got a couple hundred dollar, dollar bills. He would always be smiling. He was like, oh, yeah, well, that was just that was just a one-time lick. That was just a one-time lick. And I noticed, I didn't know if I mentioned earlier, that the tobacco kind of had like a minty, like a minty smell or something to it. So I, I would be asking him for time to time. I say, hey, man. Where you get all that tobacco from and shit? He'd just go to smile. He's like, oh, man, you know, I got moves, man. I stay, I got moves and shit. So he never would tell me and shit. You know, I'd, I'd ask him periodically and shit, you know. And so, because I thought he might have hit the lick with one of them guards or something. Because like I say, man, this shit was in some bags, you know. This this was some shit from the street in some big-ass bags. So, you know, from time to time, I say, hey, man, you know, I got a couple hundred dollars, man. But he was like, oh, you know, he'd always be laughing and smiling. But he never would actually tell me how he came up on the tobacco and shit. So, Maybe about four or five months later, you know, one night, we out there on the yard, we chilling and shit. Just me and him, we out there chilling and shit, you know. And so uh, I asked him again. I said, hey, Crafty, what's up, man? What's up with the tobacco, man? Where you get all that shit from? So he go to smiling like a motherfucker. It just, it just tickled him. He said, hey, man, well, you know, one day when I was at work, talking about when he was in the chapel, he said, I took my key and I started just trying, you know, trying other people's uh, lockers. 
the, the locks on their on locker to see if the key would fit. You know what I'm saying? He said, so he's steady going through these lockers. He ain't finding nothing. This dude get to the Indian's locker and he put his key in there. The key fit. He opened it up. They got all their religious tobacco up in that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? They, they tobacco for their spiritual cleansing and, you know, they, uh, they sweat lodge and all that shit. So he took all that motherfucking shit. I said, is you serious? He, you know, it tickled him. He said, yeah, man, I stole all that motherfucking shit. I said, man, if them dudes had found that shit out, they would have scalped you. They would have scalped you quick as a motherfucker. They, they would have used the skin off your ass to make a new teepee around this motherfucker. You know, because when they would be out there in the teepee, you could smell that shit. You know, coming when they'd be in a sweat lodge, you could smell it all over the prison. You know, you could smell that smell of the tobacco and shit. Oh, man, it just tickled him. He was giggling like a motherfucker. I said, yeah, man, them Indians, they would have had a powwow out your motherfucking ass, boy. You would have been, you know, you would have been man down around this motherfucker. You know, he was giggling and laughing, man. I said, that's where you got that shit from? I said, Crafty, you's a cold motherfucker, boy. You be taking chances and shit. You know, so, uh, yeah, he, you know, he it just tickled him and shit, you know. So I told him, man, you better be careful around this motherfucker. You know, now, you know, a lot of motherfuckers going to be like, oh, chill, well, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you discipline him and do it, all that type of shit, man? I'm not just to go tell on the motherfucking man. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it was some funny ass shit, you know. So anyway, you know, that's the end of my story, man. But Crafty, he was constantly taking chances, man, you know, uh, I think around 2010, somewhere 11, he ended up leaving and shit. And I don't know if, if he'll, matter of fact, I'll probably end up looking him up, man, and see if, and see if he's out by now. Cause like I say, I ran across him in 1989 in Juvenile Hall and he had been locked up all that time and shit. So anyway, man, that's my story on Crafty B, man. The dude, you know, if you don't pay attention, man, the dude is liable to get you, man. You know, and it's, and it's some motherfuckers like that in the pen. They always take chances regardless of the circumstances, you know. But anyway, man, that's, that's my story on old Crafty B, man. Y'all stay up, man and uh, resume normal program.